The national debt clock is flashing a major warning, red alert. The federal deficit tripled to a record $3.1 trillion in fiscal year 2020, with the budget gap ballooning to a share of economic output unseen since World War II. While most people are aware the national debt has exploded, it brought my focus back to this subject. Many of us that watch the economy closely are still trying to get our heads around the rapidly unfolding pandemic crises and the impact of trillions of dollars flowing into the financial system. America's debt has soared past $27 trillion and is now expected to leap by several more by the end of the year. All this, of course, is in play even before it was announced that House Democrats have powered through the House another $3 trillion pandemic relief bill. It is described as an election year measure designed to brace a U.S. economy in free fall and a healthcare system struggling to contain the pandemic. This debt surge would have been unimaginable just a year ago. The clock provided by usdebtclock.org provides a great deal of insight and information. A seldom and underused feature appears on the right side of the top line, it is labeled, Debt Clock Time Machine. When you click on it you are provided with a view of where the debt and a slew of data for several periods in the past. It also provides a view of current expectations four years forward. While it can be difficult to sort out much of this information, it is very helpful in identifying trends. With this in mind, it is important to note that the number of people living on government transfers of wealth has grown over the decades. Since the massive disruption in the economy resulting from the government's response to the pandemic is likely to lead to a deep recession or depression marked by reduced dividends, an end to buybacks, and softer growth. The Trump administration's decision to jump into the breach by signing the CARES Act, a $2.3 trillion relief package, is another indication that his answer to such an economic disaster is mega-spending on handouts and social projects. Sadly, because of the political environment, we are experiencing, Congress rapidly gave near-unanimous approval casting aside concerns about the deficit or the unintended social consequences it might usher in. A theory exists that during a situation such as we are facing, the government's efforts to intervene are useless and may make things worse. Sometimes when the economy is melting down, it is best to do little or nothing because the free market will over time self-correct and return to a healthy balance. The problem at this time is twofold, first, Trump doesn't view deficit spending as a problem and second, he touts the stock market as an indicator of his ability to return America to its days of glory as promised when he ran for office. Unfortunately, much of his economy is generated using this old trick of deficit spending. The deficit has exploded over the last three years. This indicates this economy as a mirage based on deficit spending. Expect this not only to continue but get substantially worse. In the past, this spending coupled with market manipulation fueled by changes in the tax laws has caused stock buybacks to explode. The bottom line is that we entered this crisis in the midst of a false economy, and it is only by the grace of this huge deficit spending that we are not languishing at the bottom of a deep economic pit. Deficit spending is not a silver bullet without consequences and is a poor substitute for the free market when allocating capital to where it is most effective. It is not economic growth but simply a method of borrowing from the future. The economy has displayed a strong tendency to boost the stock market at every opportunity. He often accomplishes his goal of rocketing the market higher even if only temporarily by, tweeting, what he views as market positive blips or banging away at Federal Reserve Chairman Powell. Many are centered around, the idea of, trickle-down economics, and how lower tax rates trickle down to benefit the overall economy. It appears that the administration sees a higher stock market as proof he is on the proper track but he is blind to how distorted markets have become. I contend that while Trump touts a fondness and respect for hard-working Americans his policies will continue to create a great deal more inequality. Low interest rates, coupled with printing money and deficit spending has always come with huge hidden costs. They include increasing speculation, distorting prices, and allowing boondoggles to be built while reducing income to savers. This money flows to big business and Wall Street first and less so to small local merchants. In short, it reeks of crony capitalism and fuels a false economy full of boondoggles. As for the economic concept of, trickle-down economics, the problem is that those at the bottom share only a few drops of the benefits while those at the top swim in a pool. Circling back to the crux of this article, America's debt is soaring and small businesses and stores are closing in record numbers. 
Do not underestimate the importance of small businesses. Last year businesses with under 20 employees totaled some 30 million, employed over 54 million workers, and contributed 44% of all sales in the country. The economic scenarios before us include growing inequality, massive long-term unemployment, and propping up zombie companies. The Japanification of America is well on its way. Stagflation or runaway inflation is also a good possibility as history indicates that a soaring national deficit is never a free lunch. Trump may refer to the campaign against the pandemic as a war, but it is just a battle. The real war is still before us as we begin to deal with the carnage the politicians in Washington have unleashed upon us. The president did not get us here on his own, he was assisted by a willing and complacent Federal Reserve in Congress. The combination of Nancy Pelosi and President Trump has been toxic to anyone interested in holding government spending at a reasonable level. It will be interesting how this plays out as the election draws closer. Trump's salvation may be that he faces an even greater free-spending Democrat as he argues that things would have been far worse if he had not taken us down this path. It is incredibility ironic that after criticizing Obama and the Democrats for taking us down this road we find Trumponomics as little different. Please forgive me for pointing out the obvious, the next presidential election is currently not set to bring about an answer to this ugly dilemma. Global debt went from $10 trillion in 1971 to $270 trillion in 49 years. Calculate the ratio and value after the next 49 years if you want to learn new numeric values. BIS, central banks, governments, commercial banks. They are all together in this. If gold wasn't owned on the paper 542 times for every physical ounce, the price would normally reflect the dying stages of the post Bretton Woods financial framework. They will hold it together as long as they need to, and they are convinced they are godsend doing good things for humanity. While central banks are walking around with $25 trillion of balance sheet assets that is. If you've lived long enough on this planet, then you know that the value of a US dollar has deteriorated immeasurably over time. Through the years, our government has reduced PM content in their coinage whereby today, a penny is worth perhaps more in copper than its face value. Taxes on gasoline and interstate tolls has gone up considerably through the years. Taxes on homes property has gone up considerably. Taxes on cigarettes and alcohol have gone up considerably. Now let's look at the downside. Yuck, yuck. Interest rates on savings have gone down, your purchasing power has gone down, your inalienable rights granted by the Constitution have gone down. Your ability to provide for your family has gone considerably down. The middle class is disappearing and you don't notice. College costs have skyrocketed and you don't notice. Bank fees, cable fees, telephone fees, utility fees, etc. have all gone up. Capitalism in its most basic form is dead, replaced by a manipulated, regulated and controlled economy and financial system. Wake up and smell the roses before they die. Maybe over an infinite timeline, but certainly not instantly. First, it's not a closed system. Second, you're not exactly increasing total money supply, as I've realized in the last couple of months after reading three white papers on the topic. It's many times more complex, depending on how the printed money, really, created bank accounts are used and its downward effect on the economy. That being said, if you pump money into a specific market, like corporate bonds, how does that in turn affect overall money supply? The holders of those corporate bonds get, say, bailed out of their malinvestment. At a glance, someone would assume that since X has increased, all assets have increased. But have they? Say the ones that held the corporate bonds are corporations, and those corporations decide to buy back stock, is that going to raise the price of milk? No, it's going to instead raise the price of that stock and lower liquidity of that particular index. So what one should take away is that, Printing money blows asset bubbles in specific markets, usually ones tied to the wealthiest individuals who profit from it, such as real estate, stocks, and other investments. It doesn't necessarily equate to price of the petrodollar across the world, which is by far the greatest factor in determining if inflation is going to hit all goods, or as mentioned above, price of everything. It is therefore imperative to realize that the US will hit massive inflation more readily if the petrodollar dominance is quashed, and oil becomes more expensive to the US. 
The way an average individual should hedge against this bubble blowing is to buy any assets like land, gold, stocks and simply hold them. But this is more to escape the increasing issues related to wage suppression, increased taxes, and other byproducts of a rotting empire guaranteeing profits socializing its economy. In conclusion, I predict you will see a massive inflation of prices in stocks, gold, and real estate in the next decade, while everyday goods and tech will remain artificially cheap, at least relatively. And we have enough history to draw on in this era of QE to see this, real inflation is growing, but at a modest pace. In the 80s and 90s, besides a few years of large inflation, it's been around 2-3%. Now it's around 6%. But look at the stock market P.E. ratios, used to be 2 to 3 times was high. Now that number is growing to 40 50 times earnings. That's 3 to 4 thousand percent over the same period. 2 percent compounded over a decade is a compounded interest of around 21 percent. 6 percent compounded over a decade is around 80 percent. So inflation of overall goods has in 20 years been an accrued 100% double, whereas real estate is 5 times that at 500%, and the stock market almost 50 times that at 4000%. This was the Nomad Economist. Please like. Share. Leave me a comment. Subscribe. And please take some time to subscribe to my backup channels, I do upload videos there too. You'll find the links in the description box. You will also find a PayPal link if you want to make a donation. Thank you wholeheartedly to all those of you who have donated. Stay safe and healthy friends.